Hey everybody, Rich here from HFX Gaming Memories, and thank you for joining us in our latest episode. I was really struggling to come up with something for the holiday season, and this just sort of happened organically. I was talking to friends about the holiday season, and nostalgia, and how those two melded together was most of us probably got our first video game console during the holiday season. Um, if you look at some of these pictures, look how happy these kids are. That's actually Mikey from Mikey's Wonderful World of Gaming, which is another Nova Scotia YouTube channel, so make sure you check him out and give him your support support as well. Uh, to say nostalgia is big is an understatement. I mean, look at my room. I have nothing but the past in here. Uh, any YouTube channel will have retro gaming, retro music. Every TV show now seems to have an 80s theme to it. The slasher genre seems to be coming back with movies like Final Girl. People just can't get enough of it. So the question is why? What's, what's, what is it with nostalgia? Uh, obviously psychologists will tell you that it's like a drug. You get that dopamine response. It makes you feel good. But the real question is, why do we do it? For me, why I collect uh, started actually in university and it was just something to do that wasn't studying. Uh, it was probably in my first year. I was spending three hours a day studying, lab work, and I just needed a break. And I had picked up a Nintendo, I think, at a yard sale. And I hadn't played games for the longest time. And you know what? I had a great time playing it. Uh, as you can see behind me, I've been doing a lot of collecting over the years, and my nostalgia isn't so much for playing the games. I'm probably what they call a shelf collector. My nostalgia actually is the going out and talking to people at games. I enjoy that. I live for that. Um, and you're probably wondering how are you nostalgic about something you're doing. Well, there was a brief period where my student loans started coming out and I had to actually scale back my uh, purchase of gaming. And I was nostalgic for that experience of going to video game stores and picking them up. Now, as we know, nostalgia is not cheap. Records are expensive. Anything from the past. The marketing people have got a hold of it and they know that people will pay for nostalgia. So if you're just an average gamer, how can you go and play some of your favorite games? Well, if you want the authentic experience, support your local shops. In Lower Sackville here, we have Capes and Cows Comics and Collectibles. They've got Nintendo. Go down, drop a few bucks during the holiday season, and get some of your favorite games like Mario and Zelda. The common ones are pretty easy to find. You will pay a little bit more, but as long as you're not looking for the ultra-rare games, that's the best experience you can get. Um, other ways to do this are to build a Raspberry Pi. Um, if you're not technical, have someone else do it for you, but it's gotten easier every single year I look at it. The good thing about that is you can pretty much have every video game system on it from Nintendo, Game Boys, Handheld, TurboGrafx-16, Sega CD. It's a good chance to play a lot of those games that you may have not actually had an opportunity to because, I mean, who owned a TurboGrafx-16? Not many people. I think I knew one guy in 30 years. Uh, the problem with the Raspberry Pi for me is that I'm uh, overwhelmed with how much choice it is and I spend more time looking at games than actually playing them. Now plug and play systems have been around for probably almost 20 years now. It started as pretty simplistic enough where you would get just a controller or more likely a joystick and you could play Pac-Man or Frog or, or something from the 70s and 80s. Uh, eventually they started making ones like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter and they just had three prong RF into your TV. The problem with those systems, um, the earlier games were fine, but games like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, there was a lot of input lag, the music was terrible, and it's because it wasn't Midway or Acclaim making them, it was someone who licensed it. The, the next integration also saw a lot of Sega systems that would have uh, Sega Genesis 80 and 1, but when you plugged these things in, they actually only had maybe 20 or 30 Sega games, and the rest were homebrews or like games you would play on DOS or Windows 3.1. Uh, again, input lag, the colors were poor, they were just a, a really poorly done ROM, and they broke very easily. So what really kicked off the minis was obviously the Nintendo Mini when that came out. You could not get your hands on this, the scalpers were charging $200. I was working at an electronics store at the time and I couldn't even get my hands on it. I actually went and bought the Famicom Mini beforehand because I could get that easier. The problem was it would almost just cripple your hands because the controller was so tiny, um, but it did the job. Uh, I eventually did get the NES Mini, as you can see behind me, uh, through an auction site. I got very lucky. So once Nintendo put this out, obviously the Super Nintendo version came out, the Sega Genesis, there's a TurboGrafx-16, there's a Commodore 64. but. With a limited run, not everybody could get a hold of that, and some people, they just want to play a few of the simple games they loved as children. 
Uh, primarily, they want to play Mario, Contra, Mega Man, and Zelda. Can't blame them. So the question comes down to, are those knockoff systems really worth it? There's a lot of them out there. People will try to pass them off as the authentic Nintendo experience. And I got talking with my friend and thought, you know what? I wasn't going to do reviews or top fives or top tens. But let's actually take a look at the cool baby 500. We're going to see... Is there enough games on this to make it worth your while? So stay tuned. So one of the things that's pretty obvious about a system like this is they always advertise 600 games. Well, these are not going to be 600 licensed Nintendo games by any means. In fact, a lot of them are going to be homebrews, hacks of various games. Uh, but there is some nice little hidden gems on here. In fact, there's games that were actually only released in Japan for the Famicom system. The other thing that you're going to notice in the video is most of these are actually PAL. European or actually Japanese versions or Chinese versions of some of your favorite games So there are slight differences in there that we're definitely going to take a look at um, Let's open it up and have a look inside so looking at the actual body of the console You can see that it looks very similar to the NES mini this version actually does have an HDMI input Although you can buy some with AV inputs, but I wouldn't recommend it unless you want to play on a CRT TV. Uh, the controller is very similar to the Nintendo. It actually feels great in my hand. There is turbo buttons, however, I find they're in a really awkward position when you want to actually use them. Um, so I've actually just completely avoided using them altogether. The cords themselves are a decent length, um, similar to the NES, they're a bit short. But the ending on them is very strange. It's more like a PC port, so you wouldn't be able to use any type of USB extender, but just get a longer micro USB to power it and a longer HDMI, and you can set further back. All right, let's go take a look at this thing. For those of you familiar with the NES Classic, it's got a great interface. It allows save points, as well as an option to change the display to 4x3 and a CRT filter, or keep it as pixel perfect. One of the other neat features about it is that it actually allows you to use a QC code so that you can get the original manuals. I was not expecting much in the way of an interface for the Cool Boy Classic, but I was wrong. It starts up with some pretty catchy music, the ability to choose Chinese or English language, and then it actually has categories for the game from Mario, Contra, Hot Blood, which we'll talk about later, Ninja Turtle Games, Adventure Island, and then the miscellaneous titles. As you can see, the artwork is a bit crude and the colors are off, especially on Bill and Lance from Contra, but really, that's just nitpicking. I think they did a great interface and I was just expecting a big list of 600 games in text format. When you select the Mario icon, you're going to be taken to a screen with 25 in 1 Mario games. Now we know on the Nintendo and the Famicom there was not 25 Mario games. So what they did to fill up this section was release the original games as well as a few homebrews and then fill out the rest with various palette swaps. For example, Mario 10 is actually just Jackie Chan's Kung Fu action adventure. Number 14 is Kid Nicky Radical Ninja. Number 16 is Joe and Mac. Number 6 is Tiny Toons. And number 9 is Adventure Island. While it's nice to play these games as Mario, I found them really difficult to play because I'm expecting the smooth control of the Super Mario Brothers as well as the ability to jump on enemies. The final palette swap games include Balloon Mario, Bomber Mario, Circus Mario, and Mario Runner, which are just palette swaps of Balloon Fight, Bomberman, Circus, and Load Runner. All great games in their own, but we're not going to worry about those today. Additionally, Yoshi's Cookie is available as well as a Yoshi's Hash Cookie, which is just a palette swap with a cannabis theme. The final two games are Space Mario, which is a really cute palette swap of Galaga using Super Mario Bros. characters. It definitely added a little bit of fun to the game that I've played so many times. Finally, we have Small Mario. This is some form of jackpot game, Kino, I'm not really sure. I actually was expecting this to be a Mario game where you're only able to play as Small Mario, not get any type of power-ups. If you're looking for a challenge, Kamikaze 1, 2, and 3 is definitely for you. It's reminiscent of those really difficult levels in Mario Maker, but be warned, both Mario and Luigi are fully naked in all of these games, so we're not going to be reviewing them for obvious reasons. Now let's move on to the real games. In addition to the classic Mario games, the Cool Baby does have the original Mario Brothers. It's a game I played after Mario 3 had already been out, so really it never did anything for me, but it's fun to play it just to say that you did. Additionally, the educational software games Mario is Missing and Mario's Time Machine are both included. Uh, these also had a 16-bit counterpart, so you're better off playing it on that if you want to play them at all. Remember, they are educational titles, and you're probably going to need the manual or go to the internet to try to figure out how to play them. 
I've beaten both of them, but yet every time I go back to try them again, I actually forget what I'm supposed to do. It's worth it just to say that you try these games, but I wouldn't put a lot of time into them unless you have young children and you want to educate them. You couldn't have a gaming system that didn't include Dr. Mario, even if they forgot to put the title in the opening credits. This is a game I actually owned as a kid and initially was disappointed in it. I was under the impression that it was going to be a side-scrolling Mario game that took place inside the human body where you fought viruses using various pills. So you can imagine how disappointed I was when it was a puzzle game. This factor was only made worse by the fact that you have to line up colors and I had a black and white television in my bedroom so it made the game impossible to play. The gameplay is exactly like it was on the Nintendo. The only difference again comes down to the colors being off due to emulation. You'll also notice that the viruses in the jar don't actually dance and move like they do in the Nintendo. Starting off with Super Mario Bros., the first noticeable difference is that on the cool baby, the game is presented in widescreen. While it is nice to have a full screen on gaming, something like this causes it to actually zoom in and results in blurry textures. If you look at the original aspect ratio 4x3 on the NES Mini, the game is a much more crisp and the colors are a lot more vibrant compared to the dull colors of the cool baby. That's a very common thing with emulation. The next thing you'll notice is that the music and sound effects are slightly different. Most noticeable when you pick up the mushroom and when you kill enemies with the superstar. Other than this, it played fairly well and I don't think there was any big differences that would really turn you off from playing Super Mario Bros. on the cool baby. Moving on to Super Mario Bros. 2, I expected to find the Japanese release of Super Mario 2, also known as the Lost Levels, but was pleasantly surprised to find it's actually Super Mario USA, which is what most people are going to be looking for when they buy the cool baby. Similar to the first Mario Bros., the game is presented in widescreen, and the noticeable differences are very minor. The color is a little drab, especially on this waterfall, you can see that it's a very dark blue versus the more vibrant colors on the original release, and slight differences in the sound effects. I didn't play much of this game, but I'm assuming it would be small little differences throughout the game that nobody would really notice except hardcore gamers. If you have the cool baby, it's definitely going to be one of the games you want to add to your playable list. Let's get into the game that everybody came to play, Super Mario Bros. 3, arguably the best game for the system. What I've done is a comparison. On the left you'll see the NES Mini and on the right the Cool Baby. Right away you can see that there is a huge difference. First of all, the Super Mario Brothers title is actually missing. The game always seems to have this yellow drab feeling to it that takes away from the vibrant colors that Super Mario 3 was known for. Opening up the map you can see that what should be a semi blue kind of bright white sky is this drab dark blue as well. The pinks, the whites, all of the colors are off and that's likely just due to poor emulation. The gameplay however is as smooth as ever. I found there was no input lag, the sound effects were pretty much bang on. I just removed them from the video because they would drive you crazy with all of the overlapping. One noticeable difference is that the game is actually in Japanese. So we enter the games or talk to Princess Peach, you're going to notice that. The mushroom houses are the same. If you saw in this video, in Japan you can actually start moving before Toad finishes talking. Overall, there's minor differences in the Mario 3 platform, but it's not going to affect your gameplay whatsoever. I can definitely say, if you're a Mario fan and you want the cool baby just for the first three Mario titles, it's definitely worth it. The minor differences that I spoke of are just that. They're so minor that only a hardcore gamer is going to notice, or if you actually go looking for them. Now that you've mastered the original games for the Nintendo, let's take a look at some of these homebrews. The first one up is Angry Mario. I was really impressed with this game. There's definitely a lot more challenge to it than the original titles, but not as difficult as Kamikaze Mario. And the good thing is, you get infinite lives. Right away, you're going to be faced with a turtle who just dive bombs you, and that gives you an idea of the difficulty that you're going to be facing. The bullet bills in this game go a lot faster, and power-ups are few and far between. I did come across the poison mushroom again, or at least I thought I did, but I couldn't find it on the second playthrough. The Goombas have an upgraded look, and the textures are generally based off the first Mario Brothers game with slight alterations that give it a nice, almost new feeling to it. Power-ups like the Superstar are still here, but they have been truncated quite a bit. It only lasts about 5 seconds just to help you get through some of the more difficult parts. The second level is as far as I got on the first playthrough, and you can see there's a little bit more puzzle solving involved, so it's definitely a game you're going to want to check out. I can't recommend this game enough. It was a blast to play, and I'm definitely going to be going back and giving this another try. 
When I saw the title Excite Mario Bros, I just thought this was going to be a palette swap Excite bike, but right from the title screen, you can see that I was wrong. This seems to be a fan's love letter to all their favorite Nintendo characters. You have Kirby, the turtles have been replaced by Excite bike characters, the piranha plant is now Samus Aran from Metroid, and there's a few others in here. For some reason, you can pick up Pikachu, but I have no idea what they do or what the purpose is. The game has some little quirks, like when you jump and hit the mushroom, it seems to run away from you. The textures are a mix of all three original Mario Brothers games, which gives it a nice little look to it. Overall, I really love the look and feel of this game, and I can't recommend it enough. Unlike Angry Mario Brothers, it's a little bit easier, but you also only have five lives, so it adds that little bit of challenge. If you do own the cool baby, definitely take your time and play this game. With the exception of Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda, Contra is the title people most often bring up when talking about Nintendo. When the NES Classic lineup was announced, it was one of the games that was noticeably absent. It likely came down to the cost to actually license it from Konami, who was probably making some good money selling it on Xbox Live. Let's take a look at what the Cool Baby has to offer. Right away you can see that Bill and Lance have had their hair color changed to black, which gives them more of a striking resemblance to Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger, who they're actually based upon. After all the various Mario games included on the Cool Baby, it was no surprise to see that there was 11 Contra games listed, even though only 3 were actually released for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Unlike the Super Mario Bros. games, the Contra subsets are just retitled games or went with their original Japanese or PAL release titles. These games are not true Contra games, they just play very similar in the fact that you move left to right and kill enemies. For example, Final Mission is just the game Scat, which in itself is actually quite a rare and fun game to play and recently came to the Nintendo Switch online service. Isolated Warrior is kind of a top-down, paper boy style shooter that's kind of generic but might be worth your time. Blue Shadow, also known as Shadow of the Ninja in North America, is just another side scroller where you play as a ninja, taking out enemies with your sword, clinging to ceilings, and using throwing stars similar to Ninja Gaiden. If you start to play Probotector 2, you may realize that this is just Super Contro with a palette swap. Well, it's actually not a palette swap. This is actually the official release of how Contra and Super Contra looked in Europe where they replaced humans with robots. I don't want to go into all the details on this because I'm actually saving it for the future. I'm planning an episode called Different Versions of Your Favorite Games You Didn't Know About and we're going to talk about it then. If Probotector doesn't interest you, don't worry, the original Super C is on the cool baby as well. I've always enjoyed playing this game despite how terrible I am at it. I think I just need more practice. There's no 30 live code so I've never been able to get very far in it. Even just relying on the extra 10 lives, I still struggle with this game. It just seems like it's a lot more action packed and it's a lot more difficult, but it's still an enjoyable game all around, so definitely check it out. Probably the strangest game in this list is Crossfire. It starts out like a Contra game. You've got a helicopter, a jungle, a large muscle bound man with a machine gun. What could go wrong? Well, first of all, you don't seem to take the gun with you into the game and you have to rely on hand-to-hand -hand combat. You do get grenades, but they can only be used to dispatch enemies in the background. On top of this, I kept getting shot in the back with bamboo spears and rocks dropped in my head. Maybe I'm missing something in this game and it's worthwhile going back and taking a second chance, but if this is all there is to the game, I can see why it was not released in North America. There's also Shatterhand, which is the proper title for the game. This game feels a little bit like the Batman for the NES, mixed with Contra. Definitely a fun game, I just didn't have a lot of time to put into it right now. Now let's take a look at what we all came to see, the first Contra. Right away, when you click Contra, you're going to notice that it actually opens up to another sub-menu of 24 games. Rest assured, we're not going to go through all of these. Each of these is just a different version of the original Contra that may include things such as starting at a separate level or always giving you the machine gun, but we're just going to stick to the original. Right away, the gameplay was fabulous. The colors were pretty spot on, the control was flawless, the game played exactly like it did on the original Nintendo Entertainment System. The only difference I noticed was very minor and that was in the base levels where the electric fence actually does not have any animation. I actually leaned against the fence just to make sure it still worked as you can see and got killed. 
For some reason, the cool baby does not seem to be able to emulate the colors blue and white very well, which always leaves waterfalls and ice looking very off color. Other than this, Contra is perfect on it, so if you're buying this just to play Contra, you're not going to be disappointed. When you see Contra Force, unless you're familiar with the Nintendo, you're probably thinking this is another homebrew just by the way it plays. Well, the truth is, it's not. It was a later release and it isn't anything like the original Contra games at all. You have four players to choose from, each with their own weapon subsets that can be upgraded throughout the play. You'll notice that the game looks very laggy, there's a lot of flashing and slowdowns. I assure you, this is not the emulation. This is actually what it plays like on the cartridge. It's definitely the black sheep of the Contra family. It's worth trying out just to say you did it, but there's really nothing enjoyable about this, and I hate to be a negative reviewer, but it's not a fun game. There's lots of awkward jumps, backtracking, in terms of jumping, if you push the A button, you only do a half jump. To do a full jump, you actually have to hold the button down, which is completely different than every other Contra game that you're probably used to, which only makes the game harder. I've never enjoyed playing this game, but as I said, give it a shot just to say that you did it. The final game in this section is titled Contra 7 and 8. These are actually homebrews that are really impressive. Right away you're dropped into a gun battle in the middle of some 1980s type city. I feel like I'm playing Robocop mixed with Contra. There's explosions everywhere, guns are going off, even the power ups try to kill you. Apparently there is a 50 live code in this so I probably could have gotten a lot more footage had I known about that before shooting it. I played both of these games and didn't notice any difference in them. I think it's just minor tweaks, but I'd actually have to read up on that. If you're looking for something beyond Contra, definitely check these out. Well everybody, thank you for staying with me on this video. It was really long and I left a lot of footage on the cutting floor and we barely scratched the surface of the cool baby. So what I'm going to do is post this video and I'm going to go back and start on part 2 right away so we can start looking at the Ninja Turtle games that I left on the cutting floor as well as looking at what are the best games out of those 525 games that are left over that you definitely want to check out. So I'm going to be looking at games that I actually played just on the Famicom or some of those old 31 and one discs that I think are really fun, as well as some of the A titles that are buried in this game system. So please stay tuned for the next episode. I'm going to work really hard to have a quick turnaround time for you. Until then, stay safe, keep gaming.